So uh, I'll call the I'll call the meeting to order at seven o two. I'm taking I'm taking note in the minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight's meeting. Uh, one of these days we'll get to an in-person meeting, but uh, for now, this this uh, Zoom meetings have been working very well. Uh, they're well attended, and uh, again, I want to thank everybody for uh, attending the meeting tonight. Uh, we've we've already had our board meeting, and I, I can uh, update the members on the results of that. Uh, first of all, we we uh, we're going to have our December luncheon on Saturday, December fourth, uh, at the Ion Hotel, uh, where we had it last year. It's uh, they have great food, and it, it's a, a a nice place to hold the meeting. It will be on uh, Saturday, December 10, uh, December 4th, the first Saturday in December at 12 noon. Uh, we, we are going to have a raffle with uh, excellent prizes and we're going to have a, the uh, annual election at, during the meeting. So if anybody would like to uh, become a board member, we need, we need a, a, a secretary and all of the the other three officers are uh, uh, you know are willing to run for re-election. But if anybody would like to uh, become a board member, uh, please uh, send Joe uh, uh, an email and let him know uh, what position you're interested in, and uh, we can we, we we can put you to use. Uh, the The four positions are president, vice president treasurer and secretary. And as I said before, uh, uh, the secretary position right now is vacant. So uh, we definitely need a secretary. It, it's not much work, uh, just take minutes of the meeting and, and basically that's it. So if anybody would like to become a secretary or uh, run for uh, uh, one of the other uh, board members, uh, please uh, let Joe know. Uh, there's also one, we have three directors at large uh, who are elected every other year. Two of the, the, the uh, directors at large were uh, reelected last year. So we have one director position open. It's currently filled by uh, Steve, but uh, he's moving out of the state. So uh, he won't be uh, running. So that, that there's another vacant position. So we have uh, one director and one secretary uh, to be filled. So if anybody is, is uh, considering uh, working in one of those two spots, uh, we would more than welcome you. So that, that uh, the election will be at the club luncheon along with the, the raffle and uh, we'll send out the, you usually have three options for the luncheon, uh, uh, one, meat, one fish, and one vegetarian. So we'll, when we send out the uh, invitations, uh, we'll let uh, you know, everybody choose their uh, option. The tickets, will, the, uh, tickets for the luncheon will be, I think $25. I think that's what we charged last year. And that includes uh, the, the luncheon and, uh, and coffee and water and tea and uh, dessert. Usually, actually, so, uh, we, should, we should probably check with the venue and make sure their prices haven't changed by a lot. Well, I can do that. Uh, yeah, I'll do that when I call them. So, so twenty five dollars would be the right price to add to, for it to be, but it's possible it might have to be higher because I don't know what their pricing is this year. And most right, I'll, I'll, I'll check. But it, it will be. I don't think it will be more than thirty dollars. So, uh, yeah. and per person, you can bring a guest and. Uh, uh, again, we'll, we'll send out details uh, within the next month. And uh, I think that basically was the business of the board that, uh, so uh, does, does anybody have any questions before we move on? 
Uh, hearing none, okay. Uh, the, uh, I think it was Joe and Howard who have set up the, this uh, month's presentation on the solar cycle. So uh, Joe, if you could, uh, or Howard, if you, one of you two could take it over. Uh, uh, first of all, I'll give the treasurer's report. Uh, the, the treasurer is, is not able to uh, be at this meeting tonight, but he sent uh, uh, a notice of that the, the club's uh, finances were in uh, great condition. Uh, nothing, nothing has changed. Uh, we're, we're not in the red. We have uh, uh, enough uh, reserve money to, uh, to cover just about anything. And so uh, uh, the, that's the treasurer's report. So uh, uh, any questions on, the, uh, on that report? Uh, hearing none, uh, uh, it, uh, Joe or Howard, if you would like to start your presentation. Yeah, it's Howard is actually doing the intro here. Okay. Okay. Um, the uh, topic tonight will uh, be uh, effect of the sun on amateur radio. And uh, the first section uh, that I'll cover is uh, um, a brief introduction. Um, I wonder how many of you have heard of uh, sunspot numbers? Have you heard about good band openings? Have you heard about solar flares? And if you've heard anything about any of these topics, the program is going to be um, of interest to you. If uh, you haven't heard uh, any of these uh, topics before, uh, all the better. Uh, Joe and I uh, will trade off topics tonight to keep your interest level up so you don't have to hear just one person. Um, <clears throat> the section uh, that I'm gonna cover next is the sunspot cycle and what it means. Um, the sunspot cycle is a complicated issue not all scientists are in agreement or uh, fully understand sunspots and their cycles. But nonetheless, uh, some of the basics uh, will be discussed uh, tonight. Uh, the sunspot, the uh, sun emits enormous amounts of electromagnetic radiation. You realize that on a hot summer day with extreme heat produced by the sun, uh, think about uh, the sun heating the whole earth. It's uh, really uh, quite a quite a uh, enormous feat when you think about it. Uh, the earth is being bombarded uh, day and night uh, by radiation from the sun uh, up to frequencies in the uh, X-ray region. Uh, one thing uh, you might be worried about, but you shouldn't be because it's a long ways off. The sun is literally burning up, um, ejecting about 2 million tons of debris uh, each second, creating a solar wind of um, 675,000 miles per hour. Think of that, uh, 2 million tons of debris each second. Uh, with an enormous uh, solar wind. Um, one of the big questions uh, uh, is how are all of these solar activities that we've talked about uh, measured? One of the primary ways is by looking at the uh, sun and counting the number of sunspots um, on uh, the surface. Um, sunspots appear as dark spots because they are uh, cooler than the surrounding areas of the sun. Uh, they may appear as single objects or in clusters, small or very large. A large sunspot would be about 80,000 miles in diameter. So it gives you an idea of the magnitude of the sun. Scientists begin study of the sun in about 1750. Uh, and the uh, event was referred to as cycle one. The word cycle was coined because sunspots <clears throat> occur typically in 11 year periods, but not always. Typically there is one 
major peak about in the middle of each period, sunspot period, but not always with relatively dormant periods of few or no sunspots at each end of the um, cycle. So at the beginning and the end of each cycle, there's very few sunspots or none. Uh, one thing about sunspots is they're always changing. It's, not, it's a fluid situation. And remember every 27 or 28 days, um, the sun um, spins on its axis. So you may see a sp sunspot for a while and it may disappear and it may come back when the sun comes around. So um, that affects the uh, sunspots during a period of, of a month. Um, the reason I said it was either 27 or 28 days is my sources indicated different, different uh, days. So maybe it's, Maybe it's between 27 and 28, I really don't know. Um, <clears throat> scientists use several methods of measuring the activity of, uh, of sunspots. Um, the method that is commonly used that uh, is <clears throat> referred to as the uh, Boulder um, method uh, is, uh, a, a, a minor takeoff of the, uh, say minor, but a month, uh, some adjustment to the method established by uh, uh, a, a fella uh, by the name of Wolf and uh, so called the Wolf method um, in 1848. Think of that uh, gold rush here in California. And there's some other methods that have come out since then, but not uh, really adopted. Um, uh, so it's it stayed pretty constant. Uh, in the uh, ARRL handbook, they refer to a couple of other different um, measurements. One is the smooth sunspot numbers uh, and solar flux. Smooth sunspot numbers range, their uh, indice is from uh, zero to 200, and solar flux numbers range from 60 to 300. Um, solar, the smooth, smooth sunspot number is an averaging method of the number of sunspots, while solar flux is a measure of the intensity or power of the emission from the sunspots. Um, I personally like to look at the solar flux number. I think that's really significant. Uh, but um, as was mentioned at our Tuesday uh, net, anytime you get over a solar number of about 100, uh, some of the band conditions become very interesting and enables you to work um, DX. Uh, we're currently in solar, the start of solar uh, cycle 25, which uh, started around, I think, um, they consider it now, I think around June is the official date, sometime in June. So we're just starting uh, the, the uh, current uh, sunspot cycle. So Joe, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about uh, the effects of sunspots on propagation. Yeah, okay. Uh, one second here. I'm, I'm gonna share slides. Uh, well, I'm gonna share slides, but yeah, there we are. Share that. Okay. And then I'm gonna hit present. Hopefully you can see that right now. Yep. Um, so this is a chart of um, actual um, the progression of the last three solar cycles. So 25, which is the one down on the right, um, that red line there is a predicted amount of radio flux during different years of the cycle. Um, so you notice, in particular, 23 and 24, these cycles are actually really different. Um, 23 was the was the truly awesome cycle. This is the this is the cycle when people on six meters and, and 10 meters, we're working the opposite coast uh, all the time. 
uh, on there. And there were even two meter band openings uh, back then because the solar flux, the radio flux, you can see is very high. It's like uh, that number he was talking about that goes up to 200. Well, it went as high as 230 or so uh, during that cycle, which is very, very high. Uh, for a solar cycle. So that was a that was an awesome cycle. And that was when I actually got interested in 10 meters. Um, there were a lot of people who bought 10 meter radios back then because you could have a 10 meter radio in your car. And while you were driving to work, you could talk to somebody in Atlanta, which actually happened to me uh, during that time. It was pretty awesome. Um, cycle 24 was okay, but you notice cycle 24 had this interesting like double peak thing. That's actually not that unusual. And, um, they did, never knew why that happened, but recently the theory is that is because the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere of the sun are actually typically out of phase. Um, they've always known that the, the solar cycle begins with Southern hemif Hemisphere sunspots and it ends with Northern Hemisphere sunspots, but, they, but it turns out the two hemispheres of the sun, the sun is so large that uh, its hemispheres can actually rotate at different, different uh, speeds. Uh, it's also not a solid body, it's gas and, and essentially a fluid. So different parts of the sun can often can rotate at different speeds. So what happens is different things happen, magnetically different things happen. So it turns out that two, if the two uh, hemispheres of the sun peak at different times, you can get, it, sometimes if they peak at the same time, the cycle will be very large. Uh, but if they peak pretty far apart, the cycle will be much smaller because you're essentially getting only half the sun playing at one time. Um, so current models predict that cycle 25 will be kind of like cycle 24, uh, as in good, but not great. Uh, but models are often wrong. Um, so what's in a sunspot? Um, these are actually different views of a sunspot. They're not the same sunspot. On the left, is an optical view of the sunspot. I think that's taken from a ground-based telescope. Um, that's a particularly large sunspot that occurred in 2016 that was visible to the naked eye. So if you had held a piece of welding glass up and looked at the sun, you could actually see that sunspot. It was that big. Um, but that's uh, basically, you know, to the naked eye, sunspots look like a dark spot on the sun. Now it turns out the sunspot is like, 3,000 to 3,500 degrees Kelvin, and the sun itself, the yellow part is 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So if you had a sunspot on your stove and you put your hand on it, you'd still get burned. Um, it's still quite hot. Uh, but what's really going on in sunspots is that though there are places where the magnetic field lines in the sun come out of the sun and make these big loops, which is kind of what you're seeing in that, that central diagram there, is a diagram of the magnetic fields associated with a sunspot pair. Actually, it's two sunspot pairs, N1 and P1 and N, N2 and P2. Those are two pairs of sunspots on top of each other, which is a very common configuration that you see, you see them in. Uh, and so magnetic field lines have a north and a south. And so in this particular thing, the north is represented by red and the, the, and the, and the south is represented by blue. Um, but they, what happens is they can actually rotate around each other and sometimes they'll get too close to each other and that's when a solar flare happens. If you get the north and the south colliding with each other on the surface of the sun, you get a big explosion and that's what a solar flare is. Um, the picture on the right is actually the highest resolution picture ever taken by the sun that was taken uh, earlier this year by a new telescope in Hawaii. Uh, and so you can see there's all kinds of structure in there, right? Every one of those little, little blobby, boily blob things is you know a few hundred miles across, uh, and so they're they're essentially little bubbles of gas and and magnetic field. And there's a sunspot in the middle of this, and what's happening is it's sucking in the magnetic field from around it, which is why you see that kind of flowery type shape um, on there. So um, Howard already mentioned that there's a sunspot number that people have been tracking and people have been tracking this for a very long time. The picture on the right, by the way, is a magnetic picture of the sun that's actually from this morning. Uh, and each sunspot has the, the sort of characteristic thing for a sunspot is the white and the black. The white is the north magnetic polarity and the black is the south magnetic polarity. So you can see they come in pairs of white and black in different parts of the sun. So there's, there's actually 
one, two, three, kind of in the middle, and then way down in the lower left-hand corner, there's another sunspot group coming on there. Uh, so there's four big sunspot groups here. So the wolf method, which he talked about, is not just counting the sunspots. That would be way too easy. Um, what they do is they, they give a factor for every sunspot group because even a long time ago, they realized that sunspot groups were like more powerful than individual sunspots just sitting there. So what they do is they assume every sunspot group represents 10, and then they count the number of individual sunspots they can count on the entire disk. And then they multiply by a, factor, by a, by a, a fudge factor uh, to come up with a number. And the fudge factor was there to account for different observers seeing different things. Like some people, there's, there's a little bit of a, of a sort of an opinion on whether something is a sunspot or just, an, a, or just a little nodule on the sun it might not be a sunspot yet. Uh, so there's actually a link on there that shows you all the, all the details of, of how that works. Now, how does this affect the ionosphere? Well, it turns out sunspots are actually pretty key to the amount of radiation flux the sun generates. Um, because there's those big magnetic field lines that I showed you that comes up, what happens is particles are accelerated along those magnetic field lines, you know, electric particles like electrons and things. Uh, and what happens is a lot of times they break off and, and fly off towards uh, away from the sun. And so if enough of that happens, you know, if there's a lot of sunspots, a lot of that will be happening. So there'll be more electron flux and more solar wind coming, to, uh, coming and hitting the earth. And when it hits the earth, it interacts with the ionosphere and it causes high ionization in the ionosphere, which is what makes the ionosphere reflective, um, at least, especially during the day. So the daytime condition of the ionosphere is highly dependent on what's going on in the sun uh, at that time. So what happens is, you know, the, the diagram on the right shows the layers of the ionosphere. You probably saw something like this in, in something like this on a, in an Adolf Burrell handbook or something, uh, where during the day, there's an F1 and an F2 layer up there. The F layer kind of splits and there's a D layer during the day that isn't there at night. And that's because when the sun is bombarding the ionosphere with, with charged particles, it gets ionized and all these layers get created and they also get more reflective. Uh, uh, the lines down at the bottom show that basically during the solar maximum, the electron density kind of moves to the right, which means it gets higher. It's about a factor of 10 higher at solar max than it is at solar min. Um, in the solar min, typically there might be no sunspots. Uh, in, in solar max, there's, there could be as many as 50 sunspots on the surface of the sun at one time. I think someone had a question. No one had a question? Okay. Um, and Howard's gonna talk about solar flares in a minute, but I'm gonna show you a simulation right here on the right, if you could see that thing. That is a simulation of a pair of sunspots launching a solar flare uh, up there. And the pretty colors actually mean something. Uh, the red stuff, actually the, the most energetic particles are the green ones and the purple ones are the least energetic. So it kind of goes purple, red, yellow, and, and green. Those green particles that you see being launched there, those actually are 10 million electron volt particles, which is super energetic. Those kind of particles will get to the earth in a few hours because they're accelerated to a reasonable fraction of the speed of light. Um, whereas the less energetic particles can take up to three or four days to get to the earth. Um, so in terms of emissions from a sunspot event, you know, like a flare or something like that, um, the, the massless particles arrive in eight minutes. Those are like x-rays, things like that. If you see a picture of the sun, sometimes you'll see like, you'll see it look like a little flashbulb went off uh, in, the, uh, space, in the picture from space. And that is a solar flare eruption uh, that will produce an x-ray flux that basically, if you can see it, it can see you. So the entire Earth, the entire side of the Earth that the sun is above the horizon will get bombarded by those x-rays. And that will cause an immediate reaction in the upper atmosphere where the ionosphere is. So that'll, that's actually how a radio blackout happens. Um, go. Yeah, go ahead. 
uh, question. Uh, does that, do the colors also correspond to the temperature? Um, yes, uh, they do correspond to temperature, but when you're talking about in space, temperature is a weird thing uh, in that the particle density is quite low in a lot of cases. So the temperature simply means how fast the particle is going more or less. Right. Um, so those green particles that are accelerated to 10 million electron volts, those are operated, those are at like 30% of the speed of light when they leave the sun. Um, so they can, they can arrive as early as 30 minutes after, a, after an eruption uh, and the, as long as maybe two or three hours, right? Um, so yeah, the green stuff is essentially hotter, but it's not hot in the sense that, you know, you're going to burn your hand on it hot. Um, whereas the, the lower particles are still plenty high from the standpoint of temperature, that is in their tens of thousands of degrees um, on a temperature scale, but they're much lower energy, like 100,000 electron volts or something like that. Um, so anyway, this is why a low level of solar flares, like the small solar flares, are often actually good for propagation. It's the big ones that are really bad. Uh, and that's because the big ones will wipe out the ionization in the, ions, in the uh, ionosphere instantly uh, by subjecting it to, to, to really high energy particles. Uh, and then it will kind of calm down over time. But Howard wanted to talk a little bit about that. So I'm gonna let him do that. Okay, yeah. Um, obviously uh, from what you've seen and uh, solar events don't always help us. Uh, certainly solar flares, uh, huge amounts of energy and radiation come out uh, all the way from very low frequency up to X-ray radiation. So uh, it's, it's uh, hugely important. Um, a lot of solar flares even miss the earth. They may not hit the earth and go by us. And that's a good thing, but uh, when they do hit the Earth, especially in the area where they where they hit, um, the uh, uh, radio uh, transmission is going to be a problem. Another uh, event that happens is called a coronal hole. I don't know if you had a picture of any of those, Joe, but. Uh, it's a little different. It's, a, it's actually a hole in the sun and they're not sure exactly why these occur, but in the outer layer, but <clears throat> when they do occur plasma, which is composed of uh, ionized gas and, and um, other, other particles um, affect the earth's magnetic field. Again, if they, hit, if they happen to hit the earth, uh, and of course, the, the big daddy of all is a coronal mass ejection, the CME. And those are of a, enormous size and uh, dire direct uh, materials out in a narrow or a fan effect. Uh, and they're uh, the most significant event uh, that occurs. And uh, radio signals are affected. Uh, we can lose uh, amateur radio transmissions for a matter of minutes or, or days um, up to a blackout. Uh, they can affect, um, a CMA could affect um, uh, satellite uh, communications, our satellites. Um, they could affect, uh, uh, they could affect power plants and control systems. Uh, in automobiles, modern automobiles could, a major one could be extremely uh, detrimental. Um, having seen some of these events, uh, I've seen uh, the band conditions just absolutely go to nothing. All, all you hear is a lot of noise and uh, maybe occasional weak signal if you're lucky. So, um, that's certainly something that happens with uh, mostly uh, HF. Now, uh, two meters and so forth, uh, not very affected by, um, by these events. 
so I'm going to let uh, Joe talk about a couple of other uh, things that relate to um, uh, so the solar uh, um, activity on the sun. All right, let me go back to Sharon here just one second. Uh, no, that one, followed by that one. All righty, okay, so this screen is about why things don't always hit the earth. Uh, up at the right, we have the two kinds of particles, the two kinds of things the sun emits. It emits massless particles, light, uh, which takes eight minutes to reach the earth from the sun. Uh, and then it emits heavier particles, particles with mass, uh, which is normally called the solar wind, but also includes things like CMEs and solar flares and, and solar protons and all that sort of stuff. Uh, those can take up to, four, up to four days to reach the earth but they don't always reach the earth. And the graphs on the bottom actually show you why. Um, this uh, pinwheel graph here, the thing that looks like a, this is how solar scientists look view, view the solar system. So every one of these little objects in here is a planet. Uh, let's see, earth is the, is the yellow one. So the earth is kind of right there at, uh, at three o'clock uh, in the middle of that thing. The sun's in the center. Uh, and you notice all of the all of the uh, debris, uh, all the streams coming out are like pin or go back like the like a pinwheel. The reason for that is because the sun is rotating, uh, and all the planets are too, but they're very slow compared to the sun. Uh, the sun is rotating, so anything that comes off the sun, uh, which is not a light speed particle, anything that has mass, is carrying the sun's rotational velocity with it. So what happens is that thing has, if you're, you, you might be sitting there staring directly at the sun, but any particle the sun emits straight towards you isn't ever going to get to you. And the reason why is because the surface of the sun is going to the side at a pretty high velocity. And that thing that comes off will, will carry that velocity with it and will essentially process away from you uh, in this circular path uh, in there. So the way these things, they animate these things uh, and you can see the, the the pinwheel parts move, but the planets don't um, in there. And the graph on the right is a simulation of a solar flare. If I can get this to play for you people, you can see the orange solar flare kind of like erupts off the sun and, go, and goes out and spreads out like that. Well, in addition, it's actually, you can see there's actually like a spinning going on at the same time. So that stuff isn't actually going, going to hit a planet that's right out to the right of it because it's gonna actually fall out of the way before that happens. Uh, but that's a, that's a, this is a simulation, it's not the real thing. Um, but so what'll happen is there is a part of the sun's disk that they refer to as the earth facing part of the disk. Uh, and that's because if a flare happens on that part of the disk, it will get to the earth. Whereas on the other side of the disk, even though we could see it, that stuff will miss the earth. So when a solar flare happens, that's one of the big things that, that they have to figure out, is it gonna hit the earth or not, right? And that usually depends on exactly where it is and also how fast it is. A faster solar flare will tend, more of them will tend to hit the earth than a slower one um, in there. Uh, wait a minute, no, no, I don't want that to play again. I wanna to go to the next page. I wanna do that. Right, thanks. Um, so how do they measure this? You've probably actually seen uh, these K and A indexes on people talking about the K, KP is, is nine or five or four or something like that. Um, these are actually indexes of the magnetic effect of what's going on in the sun. So the earth has a constant magnetic field. It's actually a very powerful field. Um, the field generated by the ionosphere and the sun is actually much weaker than the earth's magnetic field by thousands of times. Um, however, it's not zero. And so like a really aggressive ionospheric, uh, ionospheric field will actually make a compass on the ground deviate by a degree or two, um, just because there's electric currents going on in the ionosphere above your head uh, that are actually generating enough magnetism so that down here on the surface, we can actually observe that that magnetism is going on. Mm. And they figured this out in the 1700s. 
uh, because navigation was a really big thing, British Empire and all that. Uh, and so they had to be really, really certain about where their compasses were pointing. Uh, and so one of the things they measured was that they noticed that compasses moved a little bit. Very sensitive compasses would move a little bit every day. And they couldn't figure out like, why is that, right? The earth is huge, it, that should never happen, right? Um, but it turns out it's what was going on in the ionosphere was doing that. Uh, so what happened was the, uh, they came up with an index that they measured on the ground using a magnetometer, which is basically a really sensitive compass. Um, and then they averaged these magnetometers from different locations across the world and develop what they call the planetary index of this. There's actually two numbers. There's the A number, which is linear with magnetic field. And there's the K number, which is logarithmic more or less with magnetic field. The one you see quoted the most is the K index. So if you look on like spaceweather.com or something like that, it'll say KP is five, right? That's, that means there's a solar storm going on. So like this graph, the colorful graph in the bottom, this is a graph, it's, it's not current, but uh, this is a graph of three hour periods and how much magnetic deviation there was during this time. And when it's green, that means that's pretty calm solar conditions. But then there was a storm and then you got this red stuff. And that means the ionosphere is very excited and there's lots of current flowing in the ionosphere uh, when that's going on. Uh, and you know they last for a period of time as all those particles are hitting the ionosphere and, and flowing around in it, uh, causing currents to flow around, and then they subside, right? So this was like, there was an entire day here. These are three hour graphs. So what is it? Yeah, there's nine of them that are red uh, in the middle. So that was a pretty long storm uh, that was going. And that was when all, that, all, that, all those particles were slamming into the earth and, and causing currents in the ionosphere uh, up there. And it turns out there's a few other things about how they get measured, but, but that's not that important. But the important thing is that's a, uh, the, the A index is often what they refer to as the solar flux index. And that's the one that goes up to a few hundred um, in there. And so that is linear. So a solar flux index of 100 is twice as much solar flux as 50. Uh, but the K index is not the same. A, a six is a much bigger number than a five. And a four is a much smaller number than a five uh, in terms of how much flux there actually is. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, we're, uh, Howard's got a few more comments, but I, uh, I thought I would put a couple of links on here. Um, this is, uh, you know, we're still at the beginning, of very beginning of cycle 25. Like it's only like three or four months old. Um, and we don't really know how big it's going to be. Um, there is a person that I follow all the time, Space Weather Woman on YouTube. I put a link in here to, uh, to her channel. And then she does a forecast every week. I can play a little bit of that if anyone's interested. Yes, no? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Well, let me just try playing this and see if it works. I think I did this the last time I did a presentation and it worked. Space weather this week is definitely holding our attention. As we take a look at the Earth facing disk, you can see bright regions in the north and bright regions in the south. Those two bands right there are telltale signs that solar cycle 25 has really taken hold. I mean, look at the sun. It looks like it's lit up like a Christmas tree. And on the far side, we're seeing a lot of activity as well. So this is good news for people who are looking for solar cycle 25 to really take off. In fact, the solar flux has now jumped up into the triple digits once again, and it may actually stay there or stay close to there this time around and be like that for quite some time. Now, as we take a look at region 2871, this is really good news as it begins to rotate off of the Westland. Wham! Right there on the 28th, it fires off a solar storm. Now, it looks like the solar storm is going west of Earth, but coronagraph views show us that this thing is actually Earth directed. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Meanwhile, we also have region 2880. This is the new big flare player on the Earth facing disk. As a matter of fact, we even have a 5% chance of an X-class flare from this region right now. It's been growing explosively over the past couple of days and if it continues to grow like this, I guarantee you we'll see some big flares from this one. So we're all keeping our eyes on. Meanwhile, we also have a few other regions, including region 20 77. That region also was an M flare player, so we're keeping our eyes on that as well. And we could see a lot more activity in the days to come. 
Hey, good, Joe. Yeah, there's a bunch more of that. Um, if you go to the YouTube channel, she puts out a new one like roughly once a week. Um, I was kind of hoping there would be one today, um, but uh, but there wasn't a new one today yet. Probably come out tomorrow. Uh, What's that site called? Uh, it's uh, go to YouTube and search for Space Weather Woman. Um, okay. And she's a professor at Millersville University. Um, and she's been doing this for, for some time now. Um, the different color views of the sun that you were seeing there, um, those are actually different way, they're, those are taken from a uh, spacecraft uh, and it, it has filters for different wavelengths. And so mm -hmm. what you're seeing is you're seeing different depths down into the solar, uh, the surface of the sun. So you see, say the uh, I think the the last one she showed that showed kind of like the fuzz all around the sun. You're actually seeing stuff that's happening in the corona in that mm -hmm. wavelength, but in the some of the other wavelengths will show you surface effects on the sun. Uh, and so they they if you go to the Soho, I think S H S O H O has been an observatory that's been taking pictures like that of the sun for probably ten years now. Uh, oh, and right. you'll see different color pictures and they use the different colors to indicate the different wavelengths. None of those wavelengths are actually visible. So the colors, they make up the colors just to like, you know, okay, this one's blue, that one's green, that one's red. Um, but they do pick, uh, those, those are mostly uh, ultraviolet and infrared colors uh, that they're using uh, to see different kinds of activity on the surface of the sun. But it shows you a lot of the structure of like sunspots and things like that. Uh, going on there, which these guys study. So there you go. So uh, you wanted to finish up, Howard, so go ahead. Uh, I do. Um, let's see, I had something to comment on, but I don't. Uh, yeah, that uh, as far as the K index and the A index, once the K is a kind of a longer period of time, the A is a, just a snapshot, I think. That's how I looked at it. Am I kind of correct there, Joe? Uh, yeah, the solar flux index changes a lot, but because the K is, an, because you, the only K index you see is the planetary K, that means it's average right. usually for a three hour period between different. Yeah, and, and the A is more immediate. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you, you know, if you're hearing about these indexes and you wonder what it means, well, if it's six or seven or eight or 10 or higher, it, on the higher HF bands, the 20 meters to through six meters, actually, you're going to hear a lot more noise from all this solar activity, geomagnetic magnetic energy. And uh, generally speaking, the DX folks, uh, like Fred Honnold, they like to see those indexes, both of them down in the twos and the threes. That means the bands are going to be quiet. They're going to be able to hear weaker signals. So, um, however, uh, the VHF people, uh, they like uh, two meter people, uh, so forth. They like to see a little higher index because they will get the, um, uh, oh, the uh, uh, display of, uh, Oh, what do they call it? The displays, Joe, the beautiful displays up in the north. Uh, auroras. Auroras. They will, they will be able to use the aurora situation to uh, make some contacts. So um, it cuts both ways, but for most of us, you know, the K index, A index, if they're both low, that means uh, uh, the geomagnetic uh, energy is uh, stable and uh, the uh, A index is showing it's, you know, particularly, you know, if it's currently low. So uh, those are those are pretty important. I know the DXers pay a lot of attention to, to that. So anyway, I'm, I'm supposed to wrap it up here. And um, I, I would say I hope you found this short program uh, wetting your interest to explore more on all of these topics that we've talked about. Um, we just barely scratched the surface of information. We could spend uh, a whole day talking about any one of the things we just briefed you on almost. There's a tremendous uh, volume of uh, scientific information. 
So I hope uh, you'll explore some of these topics on your own. Uh, Joe mentioned sources of information. Uh, obviously, there's uh, a lot of literature out. ARRL publishes uh, uh, handbooks. Uh, I've got a couple of my old handbooks out and dusted them, <laughs> dusted them off to take a look at some of these topics. Um, they're still good. Things haven't changed that much, uh, the basics. But one thing I like to look at, and it's easy for me to look at because I subscribe to it, is the ARRL Weekly Bulletin. And they always have a, um, a, a report on the sun and the uh, sunspots so, and propagation. I find that, that quite interesting. And uh, I pass it on to several other hams that uh, uh, don't subscribe to ARRL. So it's easy to do that. And the other thing is the internet. Um, you can look up uh, amateur radio propagation. You can look up uh, Solar Cycle 25. Uh, you can look up uh, sunspots. Um, yeah, two sites I like are spaceweather.com and solarham.com. Both good sites. Spaceweather.com, solarham.com, good sites. But there's a lot of information. And if you're on the air and you've heard about, you know, the uh, sunspots being at really, really active and that there's a lot of DX on the bands, uh, you might want to look at uh, the propagation um, beacons. Those are tra transmitters that send out a, a signal, uh, not usually too much power, but um, around the world, uh, and you can start checking those and seeing what you can hear on these beacons. Uh, these are uh, uh, set up and maintained by the Northern California DX Foundation and there's some independent ones as well, but they have a number of them that, that they um, are involved with uh, to help other hams on DX. Uh, one thing I haven't used very much but there's a reverse beacon network where you can put out a signal and um, a uh, carrier and, uh, and other um, uh, uh, receivers, the automatic receivers in this system will report back your call sign and uh, your, the signal report. And that's, that's very interesting because if you find out it's a, a real good opening to um, Afghanistan and you're not hearing any Afghan stations on there, you might wanna put your uh, beam on that uh, heading to Af Afghanistan and see if you can pull up a station there that might not be paying much attention uh, to the fact that uh, there's a good opening uh, to your, your QT8. So that's uh, another way of uh, seeing what's going on on the bands is the conditions vary from time to time during the next uh, 11 years. The other, other thing I like to do, you know, when I believe there's some band opening somewhere, I like to start out at the highest band that I have capability on. And, and that's uh, that, that might benefit from uh, uh, good propagation. So I start at six meters and I'll listen for a minute on the calling frequency. And then I go down to 10 meters. I listen there a little bit. I go down to 12 meters, 15 meters and 20 meters to see if uh, there's any activity, particularly DX activity and some of the DX windows of those bands. So um, that's what I do uh, often. And I know a number of other people do the same thing. They, they, and they run, usually run down in that order. And what they're trying to find is the maximum usable, usable frequency. And uh, sunspots have a lot to do with that. We didn't get into maximum use, usable frequency very much, but the ionization 
is highest just at or below the maximum usable frequency. So uh, in the, in the uh, uh, ionosphere. So those are, those are some of the things I look at. Uh, and I realized uh, as I prepared this, you know, the next obvious, <laughs> obvious program would be to talk about uh, propagation. You know, we've talked about the effect of the sun and we've talked a little bit about Joe got in a little bit into the different layers of the ionosphere, but we could have a good conversation on uh, propagation and, and invite someone like Fred Honnell to uh, uh, give us some firsthand information. And uh, he might be an interesting speaker to even have every six months if he was willing to do it to kind of report to us on what's happening in the uh in the ionosphere uh you know uh to help uh, ham radio or to take away from ham radio with some of these events that are harmful to communication so uh, those are some ideas where we might might be thinking about going at least i am uh, in the months ahead, years ahead, uh, as far as uh, a program, you know, a report uh, might not be a full program, but it might take a, a few minutes in some cases, and we'd be through with that discussion. But I, I'd like to keep everybody posted on the HF uh, propagation so that um, you can take advantage of it. It's just a lot of fun to work people um, out of country. So thank you very much uh, for listening to Joe and I. And Joe, thanks for the great uh, slides you brought up. Don W6FS has his hand up. I noticed. Well, he's muted, muted right now. Well, if you're still there, Don, did you have he, a? He is. No, he is. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was very informative. I really enjoyed it. Uh, but I also noticed that we have a new ham with us. Michael Flagg is sitting there, okay? And he just passed his tech se session, okay, with us that last Saturday. So thank you much for joining us, Michael. We really appreciate. And then I see a couple others. That we have a Bob K. I'm not sure who he is. Uh, anyhow, so, uh, but thanks, thanks much. So, we really so why don't it. you guys introduce yourselves, actually? Michael? You, yeah, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself? You need to, to unmute. unmute your, you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I was trying to use the uh, temporary unmute, but it wasn't working because I wasn't in the right uh, window. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Michael Flagg, as it says. Uh, I got interested in ham uh, because uh, we travel off road a lot with uh, the Jeeps and uh, ham is a little bit better range than CB does, a little bit more reliable. Um, so I'm just getting started. I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> I need a lot of probably advice and guidance about you know radios and what works and what doesn't work and antennas and things like that. Um, but I'm not rushing into anything either. So, um, and I am interested in, in uh, joining the club uh, just so I can have some more contacts out there, more knowledgeable people, people with more knowledge than I have, but because I've got none. <laughs> sure. Do you have a radio yet? I do not. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sure there's lots of hams that, will, that would love to tell you what the best radio to buy is because hams love that. <laughs> I, was, I was looking at it. And a cheap one, a cheap handheld, just to get something to start listening in and see how things go, you know, just as a starting point before I try and get some kind of mobile set. Yeah, I mean, that's a good, that's a good way to start. Um, it's uh, often, uh, a lot of people do that. They get, they get a cheap radio, they get the repeater programmed in, they check in on the net, you know, they, they listen to the repeater, that sort of thing. Um, so if you get a radio, I'd be happy to help you learn to program it. Yeah, that was the next topic that was going to come up was how do you program the damn thing? I mean, I, I'm, very, I'm a systems engineer, so computers are no mystery at all. But uh, the radio piece of it, I don't know anything. 
Well, the good news is you can put those two things together because most radios these days can be programmed from a computer. You need a cable to, to hook it up, but, but generally, you know, like uh, that's how I program almost everything. Like some of the radios, I, like the GMRS radios I program have to be programmed with a computer because you can't program them. Like there is no keypad uh, to do that. But, you know, but it, if you it, drop me a note, if you, if you buy a radio, I'll help you learn to program it. Uh, and Michael, uh, you're more than welcome to join us for the Christmas luncheon on, on December 4th. So if, uh, if you have that day available, it, it starts at 12 noon at the Ion Hotel. So you're, you're, you'd be more than welcome to join us for that. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. And I probably owe you guys some dues once I figure out uh, exactly, I didn't understand on the webpage exactly what they meant on the, on the dues. So there, there, the right direction there. You, don't, you don't owe any dues until next year. Right, you got a you got a free year by passing the uh, by passing the uh, exam at one of our ham cramps. Oh, wonderful! So you're on now, uh, and if you, you know, if you want to give us money, that's great, but but you don't have to. <laughs> uh, I have a comment, uh, Paul, to the board members primarily. Uh, could could I address them? Of course, uh, and also the the VE group. So Don, I'm looking at your mugshot there uh, on the screen. <laughs> uh, yeah, five figures. <laughs> um, well, anyway, um, you know, with this new group, uh, we've got, uh, what is it, six? Six, it seems to. I, yeah. I invited all six of them to this meeting. You're right. And actually I thought at least one of, at least one of the other ones it seems that to me actually said yes to the calendar invite, but didn't actually show up. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, it'd be good to give them a call and uh, get a list together of uh, of uh, possible Elmers that would be able to uh, help them um, get started. What do you think? What does everybody think of that? I, I think that's an excellent idea. It's pretty and, easy to get, you know, we just heard from a gentleman tonight. He's wondering what to do next and where and how. And uh, an Elmer, you know, assigned to that uh, ham, that new ham would uh, be a great asset uh, to the person and, and, and encourage the person to become, actually become active in ham radio rather than maybe get on the air for a few months and then put the handheld in the drawer, you know, because they don't know what more is out there. And uh, that's one comment. The other comment I'd like to make is that, uh, and I know you said it last, uh, at the last, uh, at the meeting Tuesday, uh, but we lost a very good member in our radio club, uh, Catherine Barstow. And, uh, I heard uh, today that she uh, passed away on 9-11. Uh, yes. She had a brain bleed and just uh, did not recover from it. So I hope everybody will think good thoughts about Catherine. Yes, thank you, Howard. Uh, if Don, I, you have the phone numbers to the new ham, so uh, I'd be willing to make the phone calls to them if uh, if uh, you send me the, their phone numbers. I'd be happy to do that. And uh, most of them, some okay. of the people did not give me a number, though we have all of them had email addresses. Well, I'd okay. I'd be willing to be uh, Elmer for one or two, Don. Paul, did you hear that? Yes. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Okay, so I will send you the information on the new hams that we have, Paul. Okay, I will send it to you, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And we can go from there. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any further questions about anything? 
regarding uh, the club or the ham radio or anything? Yeah, I, I, uh, Bob Kleinbrom, uh, I've actually been in the club for a little over two years now. And uh, what helped me was a year ago, right before a pandemic hit, you had another silent key and you had a lot of equipment. And Joe, you had it uh, over at your house. Um, I actually picked up an FT2500M. That's my main VHF radio right now. It, it works like a charm. That's, a, that's another source, some of that equipment that you have for people that are interested in getting into the hobby. Um, I picked up two radios from you, uh, 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 ICOM 701 that I'm still working on. It's in, in pretty bad shape, but that FT2500 works like a charm and it's a workhorse. Yeah, I actually had fired up the 2500, so I knew that actually worked uh, yeah. when you got it. So uh, so that's great. I mean, that's exactly what that, that Silent Keys family wanted to have happen. Right. Yeah. They said, you know, like, give this equipment to people who use it. And we did. And, you know, as far as I know, there's at least two or three people using that equipment now. Yeah. Good. OK, uh, any other questions? Well, before we leave, I'd like to thank Joe and Howard for that excellent, wonderful presentation. Uh, that was extremely informative. Yes, yeah, it was very, very good as as usual. It's, uh, every every presentation has been wonderful, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Don for the the six new hams. Uh, uh, he oh was, yeah, uh, he was leading the the ham cram, and uh, uh, thank you, Don, for doing that. That was that was wonderful, and uh, had a big we, part in that. Who in three CKF had a big part of that? Joe, okay, successful good. session. Good, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, th thank both of you. I wonder uh, if the hams have gotten their call signs yet. I I don't believe so. I I looked this morning and they were not there yet. Yeah, I checked this morning and it wasn't there yet. <laughs> it will be. It will be. Yeah, it's uh, it's normally a like a week okay because i sent them in the mail i didn't do them over the internet okay i was a little hesitant to do that it would be i'm, I'm an really optimist new. and i sit in front of a computer all day anyway so you know click click check yeah so, supposedly if i take and scan all of the forms okay into a pdf file and send it to them they will do it quicker you with me but that was a matter of scanning all the forms and putting them in PDF form, you know, PDF files, okay, and then sending them. And each one has to be in its own. I mean, each candidate has to be in its own thing. I read that. You wouldn't have to scan the, the three forms, the test, the 605, the CSCE. <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided not to do that. So Good. they they went out uh, Monday morning. Okay, last this last Monday morning, okay, is when they went out. So, so it's back east, so Dayton, so it'll, uh, or yeah, Dayton, right? Yeah, and so it'll take a little while. So, sorry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> no problem. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? Well, hearing none, uh, I hope to hear everybody on the, uh, Tuesday's check-in and uh, make plans for Saturday, December 4th at 12 noon. And I, I think that's it. Uh, thank you again, Howard and Joe, for the, this wonderful presentation. And uh, I guess I'm closing the meeting at 8.06. So uh, I th thank you, everybody. And, and good night. Good night, everyone. Thank Seven you. trees. All right. Seven. Thanks, everybody. All right. I will end this in a moment.